Um, so thanks for being here. Thanks for st sticking around for the last talk. Um, this won't be a technical talk. I'm going to talk about the, some policy stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, my name is Jeroen van der Ham. I work at the uh, National Cybersecurity Center in the Netherlands. A bit about me, I have a PhD in computer networking that I do almost nothing with and wasn't very helpful to me in the CTF because there was no networking in the CTF, but oh, that was a shame. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, NCSC. I have some um, interest in anonymization. Um, we did a project on an, um, network traffic anonymization last year. A um, couple of years ago, I ran into an ethical dilemma and that made me have some interesting conversations with people. And then since then, I've been interested in ethics, um, ethics in computer science, and then especially ethics in, in security. Um, and I'm uh, co-chair of the um, uh, Code of Ethics SIG in uh, FIRST. Um, that where we're trying to uh, think about what ethics in first would uh, would look like. Um, but most importantly, um, uh, my focus at NCSC is uh, is with um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So my job is to uh, convince others that coordinated vulnerability disclosure is a very good idea. When I'm not doing that, I uh, sometimes in a hackerspace in Utrecht. Um, I have a guest appointment at the TU Delft at the moment. I was at the University of Amsterdam, and I'm starting at the University of uh, uh, Twente for one day a week uh, soon. Um, but back to vulnerability disclosure. Um, I think we can all agree that um, vulnerabilities, that, that systems have vulnerabilities. Everything is broken. Um, and we just have to find a way to deal with that, with the fact that everything is broken. And one of the quotes, I don't remember who said it, but being able to receive vulnerabilities and being able to handle them properly is what matters. And that is one of the core ideas behind um, uh, vulnerability disclosure. Um, governments haven't really been thinking about this, and this is where um, governments really should be thinking about this, because... Um, yesterday we heard about people who ran into um, uh, law enforcement and um, basically we heard that that is not really a good deal. And what we want to do with vulnerability disclosure is really make sure that that doesn't happen or that doesn't need to happen. Um, and so the, most of the vulnerability disclosure stuff has been happening under the radar. Um, some companies do accept uh, disclosure notices. Um, some companies don't react that bad, that well. Mostly it got solved some way or another. Uh, but now governments are starting to pay attention because everything is becoming a connected computer. Um, and this includes uh, safety sectors like we saw in cars. Cars can be hacked. We saw in healthcare, pacemakers can be hacked. Uh, and in manufacturing with all kinds of consumer products that can uh, pose a danger to health. Um, so yeah, cars, the Jeep was hacked, um, and even apps that control toilets, toilet seats can be hacked and they, they can pose a danger to people. So this got governments also th thinking about liability for software systems and hardware systems. Um, and making rules about um, dealing with vulnerabilities. Um, so there's some national and international efforts, um, and that's a lot of governments talking to each other in different ways. The, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise was a, a result of the, um, the Global Conference on Cyberspace which happened in the Netherlands in 2015. It will be happening in India um, in November. This is where a lot of the governments around the world gather and they talk about developments in cyberspace, um, which means vulnerability disclosure, but also uh, capacity building, uh, uh, what to do about for, uh, cyber warfare, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the things that came out of it was that there was a working group uh, in the GFC, where a couple of governments started to think about what can we do to promote the idea of CVD uh, and implement this in our own countries and in other countries. 
Uh, in the US, there's the NTIA, the National uh, Telecommunications and... Um, uh, I don't remember what the I stands for, but this is the um, part of the Department of Commerce that, that thinks about telecommunications and internet kind of stuff. Um, and they have ran a, um, a multi-stakeholder process to gather information from researchers, vendors, um, uh, governments, um, all kinds of other stakeholders in the whole process of vulnerability disclosure to, to see what it would look like in the US. Um, so I mentioned we have a, um, a vulnerability disclosure. There's an ISO standard, actually, that describes vulnerability disclosure. So if you're doing vulnerability disclosure, you can point people to uh, ISO 29147, which is actually available for free. Uh, so you don't have to pay for it. The other one, the companion one, is 30111, which does uh, describes the implementation of a process like that uh, within a company. Uh, that one is actually not free, but if a company invests in that kind of um, uh, process, then they, they sh should be able to pay for it. Um, finally, ANISA is looking into this. They've done some research within Europe. The idea is gaining more traction. Um, and there are a lot of governments thinking about vulnerability disclosure and making sure that this is a, a good way for hackers to report vulnerabilities. Um, and a couple of months ago, actually, the Department of Justice in the US put out a framework saying, this is how you can um, uh, invite hackers to hack your software and uh, that they can report vulnerabilities to you in such a way that they, they don't get prosecuted. And that is especially um, how we in the Netherlands also uh, came to our model. In the Netherlands, this has been very, very popular. We've published a, a guideline for how to do responsible disclosure. Back then it was called responsible disclosure um, in 2013. This was the situation uh, just in 2015. And all kinds of companies, there's ISPs, there's security companies, there's um, uh, an internet store, there is a uh, banks, the water companies, um, municipalities, all kinds of companies are publishing this kind of uh, vulnerability disclosure because they're very happy with it. Um, how does it work? The, um, at the NCC we wrote a guideline to describe how this process would work and there's a um, guideline for the researcher and there's promises for the organization that both come together in a single document that gets published and then um, um, the, at the end the company promises saying if you follow these guidelines then we won't um, we won't sue you and we won't report you to the police um, and Actually, the Public Prosecutor Office in the Netherlands, they supported this idea and they've published similar guidelines saying, um, uh, if you follow these guidelines, then we won't prosecute you. And I'll get back to that, how that works technically at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. But these guidelines are basically like timely disclosure. As a researcher, you're, you're expected to report this to a company as quickly as possible. Um, that you keep them uh, confidential while you're talking to the company, um, while you're doing the disclosure, um, that the measures you take when you're doing your research are proportionate, that the stuff you download is also, you don't go too far when you're downloading stuff to prove that you've actually had access, um, and that you use the, the least invasive method, method of proving that you um, uh, have a vulnerability. Um, Companies can actually exclude all kinds of things like brute forcing, backdoors, malware. Um, that's up to them. Most of them have done uh, have done this, but uh, you can see that some companies are now changing this and becoming more proportionate with this uh, with these ideas. Um, how does it work? So the the companies they they put up a statement, like I said before, at the on their website. And on the, the statement, they publish the guidelines that are specific for them. They include a, a contact information, usually a PGP key to, um, to communicate securely. 
um, and uh, some idea of how quickly they will f uh, fix the, the the reports that you uh, that you send. Uh, and then some of the companies actually give you um, give you stuff. Um, the Dutch government, where, where I work, we give you a T-shirt. I hack the Dutch government and uh, the IRS. They give you a trophy, a small trophy, uh, and they actually have a program so you get a, a small trophy. If you have multiple bugs and you have multiple trophies, you can trade it back in and you get a bigger trophy. <laughs> so it's a it's a nice program. Or of course, there's bug bounties. Um, at least most of the companies, many of the companies that actually start implementing this, they're a bit scared at first. But once they start doing this, they, they see that there's, this is a very positive development. And after a couple of years of doing this, the companies actually came to us and said, we really like this idea. We are usually multinational companies um, and we have trouble doing this in other countries. And we would like to state officially that we support this idea um, so to convince other governments that they should be doing this as well. So they came out and they um, came to us and we helped them uh, form a uh, group that signed publicly a manifesto when uh, last year when we were the, the uh, we had the EU presidency. So there was a formal event at the EU presidency with all of these uh, CISO, CISO CISOs and CEOs um, that really supported the idea of vulnerability disclosure and are working now to help other governments convince the, uh, that this is a good idea. Um, you see also many of these companies are probably familiar to you. Um, the companies are now jumping into the gap that uh, vulnerability disclosure is creating because this is a service that companies can be helped with um, um, to pay out the bug bounties, but also to, to start with the, and prepare for a vulnerability disclosure program. Um, so there's HackerOne, BugCrowd, Synac, uh, and ZeroCopter, and maybe there's more. I'd, I'd like to know if there's more companies that do this. Basically what they do is they help with the researchers. They, they keep reputation systems for the researchers so that it's clear for companies that they're dealing with serious people. And at the other hand, the, the uh, bug bounty pro, um, providers, they helped companies to make sure that the reports are, are genuine, um, that they uh, have a good system in place to actually fix stuff. And they'll also tell you, most of these bug bounty programs, they'll also tell you if it's not a good idea to implement a bug bounty program because you need to do a pen test first, you need to do um, some checking, you need to have adequate secure, uh, capacity to actually fix your bugs um, before you start doing this program. Um, so that's been pretty successful. And one of the things that I uh, try to convince companies of is that hackers are not scary people. Um, many of the companies that try to do vulnerability disclosure programs, they think well, there, then there's always going to be all of these very um, um, evil hackers that are going to report all kinds of things to us and they want money and they want all kinds of stuff from us. They want free stuff. Um, but actually, the NTIA uh, that I mentioned before um, did a survey among all of the, uh, among many of the uh, researchers, about 400 of them, and they said, what is it that you value most when you do a, a bug report, a vulnerability report? And this is what they came up with. So this is a uh, multiple choice question. Uh, you can select multiple options, so it adds up to more than, a lot more than 100. Um, so 14% wish to remain anonymous. Only 15% actually expect to be compensated for their time, 15%. 20% they said they expect nothing. Most expect an acknowledgement once things are fixed. Um, many of them, they expect to be involved in testing mitigation. Even if, even if they're not paid, they still expect to be involved in actually fixing this stuff and making sure that the world is becoming a better place. And the most important one, 70%, 
actually expects regular communication. And this is um, one thing that we found, that we've started to realize, companies don't know that what happens internally is not visible to a discloser, to a reporter. Once you're working frantically inside of your company, nobody outside of the company is going to see this. And as a hacker, you feel sometimes frustrated um, because you don't see anything going on and you think that the company is not working on uh, fixing the bug. While the company can actually easily fix this by just doing, sending regular updates. So you're saying, we're working on it, uh, we may have a question for you, or uh, this is the expected date that we have uh, fixed uh, available. So that's, I think this is a very um, compelling argument saying the vulnerability disclosure works. Many of the people that want to do it are actually trying to make the world a better and more safe uh, place. Uh, and this is a bonus for the companies that actually start doing this. But um, uh, I'd like also like to show that it doesn't, um, uh, the law can still be involved even if you're trying to do a vulnerability disclosure. We've had a couple of cases in the Netherlands where this actually happened in the past few years. Um, and I'd like to describe and I'd like to tell you what actually happened and where this may or may not have gone wrong. Um, in this case, this was a hospital in the middle of the Netherlands. Um, and the, um, uh, the, the hospital had an FTP server, there was a testing server or something, uh, and it was available, it, it was um, approachable on the public internet, and it had a very easily uh, brute forceable administrator password. It was, uh, so the, the hospital was called the, the Groene Hart Ziekenhuis in uh, Dutch, the Groen uh, 2000. Okay, you can brute force that. So the hacker finds this and he informs a journalist because he's afraid of getting in touch with the hospital directly. The hospital uh, itself doesn't have a vulnerability disclosure policy. So he's not sure how the hospital is going to react. So he uses a journalist to act uh, as a proxy for him, which is, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, and the journalist in question was someone who uh, had knowledge about how this whole process and has a name for doing this kind of thing. So this is not a uh, bad idea. So the journalist informs the hospital at 10, um, and he actually publishes the story at 3. This seems like a little bit of a um, strange thing to do, but what actually happened was that the hospital, the management of the hospital had had a crisis training the week before, and they got this report, and they went into full crisis mode. And one of the things that they learned when doing crisis management training is Communication is key. You have to inform the public that what is going on. So they wanted to put out the press re release immediately. Um, and the journalist got wind of it and he f felt that his scoop was going to be, was going to disappear. So he published the story because the hospital was going to publish it anyway. Um, in the end, the hospital reports the case to the police. Um, the police starts doing uh, investigation. And the hacker used, had used a uh, port scan tool for two weeks using a VPN. Um, he retrieved uh, password hashes of the FTP server and brute forced them. He shared those credentials with other people online in chat rooms and uh, with some friends. Um, he installed malware using his own IP um, to actually gain a persistent backdoor on the uh, on the network of the hospital. And using that uh, backdoor, he downloaded multiple medical files, even those um, of uh, famous Dutch persons, um, and started uh, looking at those and sharing those with his friends. Uh, and he sent screenshots of those files to the journalist. Now, um, Finally, he states that this was all done in the public interest in order to prove that the hospital had very bad security. The judge looked at the case and said, well, the, the public prosecutor has a discretion to prosecute because they put out the statement saying, we won't prosecute you unless um, you cross these, uh, these uh, lines. Um, so the judge first says, yes, 
um, uh, it's clear that the, there may be some crossing of lines that you've uh, stated before. So yes, you have a discretion to prosecute, and a judge is going to act uh, to look at what you've done is proportionate and subsidiary. Um, so the judge emphasizes that revealing security vulnerabilities can be in the public interest. So this is very helpful for us because he states here clearly that the idea of vulnerability disclosure, coordinated disclosure, is a good idea uh, in principle. Uh, and, and especially when medical files are at stake, um, he finds that there was no other way for the hacker to discover the vulnerability. Um, this, so th even installing the malware was necessary to show that the network of the hospital had very weak security because they hadn't detected it. He was using the back door for a couple of weeks before going to the to the hospital and reporting this, and the hospital hadn't detected him. Um, however, the hacker had access to server and data uh, multiple times, including data of famous people, and this was not necessary to report the vulnerability. He really went too far because he downloaded a lot and a lot of data. Finally, he was sentenced to 120 hours of community service. So this was not, it wasn't that bad. But it was very clear that the hacker here crossed the line um, and was prosecuted for it. So we have a, um, a similar case. That's the only other case that I know of where um, uh, a hacker got uh, prosecuted. The hacker in question is uh, uh, this guy. Um, He's not your typical hacker. Uh, he was actually, uh, uh, he is again a member of parliament. Um, and what happened is that um, he was also a journalist before he joined the parliament. An acquaintance of his um, shoulder surfed a uh, password for a medical system. And um, he, the, 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 Login and password were very simple, and so he shoulder surfed them and he shared them with uh, somebody else. The disclosure does reconnaissance, prints a few files, anonymizes them. Um, so he accesses the, the data uh, and he strikes some, uh, some things out. Um, then he calls the, the help desk of the, uh, the system in question, and the help desk has no idea what to do with him. They have no idea what the security bug might be, and they just say, please send a, a report, a written report, so that we can actually act on this, and that we can send it to the right people, uh, that we can do something with this. Um, the disclosure in question is actually, he's not happy about this. He was expecting to be taken more seriously. So he goes to a local TV station, and he tells them about his findings. And then he demonstrates to the journalist on camera that he can log in and that he shows some, some patient files um, uh, that he can access them. So the judge again said that this can be in the general interest. Um, it was reasonable to test. It was uh, defensible that you print a few of them so that you can actually show that you have a vulnerability. Um, he should act in a general interest, he should act proportionately, and he should have acted in the least invasive way. Um, proportionately, it was not necessary to review the files with a journalist. He shouldn't log on to the system on camera to actually disclose all of this stuff. There was no reason to go to the media, um, because this was something that he shoulder surfed. There was no big vulnerability that everybody could exploit. I mean, well, it's... The password wasn't that uh, sens uh, wasn't that complicated, so it could have been, but there was no reason to assume that it was actually widely known that this password was uh, 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 was so simple, um, and there were no indications that anybody else had logged in. And he should have also taken more effort, as a member of parliament and as a journalist, to reach uh, to be more. Um, strongly worded towards the help desk in convincing them that there was actually a problem going uh, going on or try some other way to reach the, the relevant people in the hospital or the uh, organization to actually get this fixed. 
Um, so he, in the end, he got a $1,500 fine. Um, so, yeah. Other cases, uh, a, good, um, a good case, in this case, KPN. KPN has been uh, very helpful in, uh, in doing vulnerability disclosure. They do some research of their own. In this case, um, they were very happy that they had the vulnerability disclosure program because two ha hackers found vulnerabilities in modems. So the, the stuff that you have at home, um, these are widely used by KPN and its customers. And the vulnerability can be used for DDoS attacks, or you can just log into the modem and you start intercepting data and exfiltrating it. Um, yeah, they give complete remote access. Um, the hackers in this case, they tested the vulnerabilities only against their own modems. They didn't test this to any other of the customer's modems. And uh, once they found it, they wrote up a report and they sent it to KPN. Um, the cert of KPN takes the report and um, after some checking, after um, some looking at the, the vulnerability, they found that the vulnerability was actually pretty complicated uh, to, to exploit. And they invited the uh, had to call hackers to their office to actually show and explain how they found this and how to exploit this. Um, once they realized what was going on and how they could, could fix this, they, um, they fixed it within a very short amount of time. Uh, and then the ethical hackers were reported with KPN goodies and they um, allowed them to go to, um, I think it was Hack in the Box, to present their findings there. So they even paid the tickets for a, for a Hack in the Box and uh, um, allowed them to present all of their research there. Um, and then they also use this case to showcase to everybody else that they take security very, very, very seriously. So they use it as a positive publicity to, to show the, their commitment to security. Uh, and to do that, they release a press statement, they create a video, um, and um, they invite more ethical hackers to actually hack their stuff and report the vulnerabilities to them. So, um, wrapping up, governments take uh, vulnerability disclosure seriously, but they need some help to actually get this, uh, to get this stuff fixed. Um, there are more and more organizations that cherish and appreciate the involvement of ethical hackers. And um, the, the coordinate, as I've shown, We've been doing coordinated vulnerability disclosure in the Netherlands for a couple of years, but this doesn't give everybody a carte blanche to start hacking any, everything and um, breaking into all kinds of stuff and downloading all kinds of data. Um, because you can still be prosecuted. Um, but it does give you a very good field of how to, uh, how to approach this. Um, and with that, I'd like to end the presentation. Thanks. Okay. Do we have any questions uh, in the room? Well, if there's no questions, I have some more, some, some other stuff that I can show. Uh, we had the um, let's see. We had a presentation of, of the the French showing what happened there and uh, stuff about um, encryption. see. So the stuff about encryption and how France and other countries got uh, laws on an encryption and the export of encryption. Um, and this also affects vulnerability disclosure. Um, the Wassenaar arrangement is a, um, an agreement, an arrangement between 41 countries in the world 
on export controls for conventional arms, dual-use goods, and technologies. What that means is that these countries, um, they come together they, each year and they start discussing all kinds of developments in the world, what kind of stuff is being used to make uh, arms, to make dangerous things, and uh, what kind of stuff uh, can be used for, for uh, du uh, dual use. So it can have a good civilian use and it can have a, a, a very bad uh, military use. What they do is they create a list of all of these products and each of the countries use that list to, to check whether something is um, uh, export controlled, which means you have to apply for a license if you want to export it to another country. Even if it's a country that is in the export uh, uh, within this group. Now, one of the things that they've done in the 90s where the crypto wars actually started is that they thought crypto was a bad thing and crypto should be export controlled. So they created a definition saying a symmetric algorithm employing key length in excess of 56 bits. Yes, this still says 56 bits. Or an asymmetric algorithm where the factorization of integers is 512 bits. It still says 512 bits. If you do anything more than that, uh, and you export it, then you have to apply for a license. And you have to explain who you're going to export this to and what they're probably what they're going to do with it. Um, the world hasn't broken down since 1990 because we have a uh, an exception with a software saying that if something is open source software, if it's freely available for for free, then it's not export controlled because then it doesn't make any sense to actually have controls on it because it's so widely available. <clears throat> so this is why you can still download OpenSSL, TLS, web browsers, etc. <coughs> But if you're Cisco and you make VPN boxes, you have to apply for a license. Um, now, to intrusion software, in a couple of years ago, we had the Arabic Spring, and uh, the governments in, in the central Mediterranean, um, they used all kinds of software to track their dissidents, and other um, governments said, well, this is not really a good idea. Uh, we would like to put a stop to that. We would like to uh, prevent um, evil or, uh, uh, yeah, basically evil governments from getting their hands on intrusion software. So, what they said systems, equipment, components, etc., uh, anything that has to do with intrusion software, um, fortunately, they, they did think about this. The intrusion software itself is not export controlled. So if you have a laptop that has that's malware infested and you're crossing a border, you're not you're not breaking the law, which would be <laughs> um, a little bit counter counterproductive. Um, uh, but finally, there's also the technology and the technology for the development of intrusion software. And technology within the context of Wassenaar is a little bit special because the idea is they want to prevent the export of software. But if you want to prevent export of software, you also want to prevent other people from telling you how software works, because otherwise the, the, the regulation on software is not going to help. So if I explain to you how a malware works, um, then I'm doing export. And if I'm doing this here within Luxembourg, and there's people of many different nationalities here, that is also considered export. So. Um, you could be held um, that you would have needed an uh, export license for actually giving a talk. Uh, and it takes a couple of months to get one of those licenses. But it, it could also be that um, uh, if you're sharing a, a proof of concept with the idea of doing disclosure, that you would also need an export license. And that's something that we don't really want. So intrusion software is and they thought about this for a long time, and they came up with this kind of definition that looks very uh, good, or at least they thought it did. Software specially designed to avoid detection by monitoring tools or to read 
protective countermeasures of a computer network capable device performing any of the following. So the extraction of data. So anything that covertly tries to export data is intrusion software. And then this one, this beauty, is a modification of the standard execution path of a program. This sounds really good, but in practice, we have no idea of determining what the standard execution path of a program is. And if we did, then we'd be out of a job. Because then you would know what a, a secure system would be, because you would know how it would behave, and any deviance from the standard execution path would be malware, um, and then you would be very able to detect it. So this, this one doesn't really make any sense, but that's a problem, because then you don't really know what's, uh, what the modification of a standard execution path is, because even a plugin could do that or any kind of Word document or whatever. They did exclude some things. Um, uh, interestingly, they excluded smart meters. I have no idea why, um, but they did. Um, and uh, well, so this has been an ongoing discussion within the Wassenaar arrangement. The problem with this is the discussions each take a full year to go into, um, uh, to get into an agreement, to get a signed agreement, and then it takes another year to get implemented. So we're still stuck with this. Officially, you have to apply for a license if you're doing some kind of malware uh, research and sharing that with uh, foreigners. Um, we're trying to get this fixed. Meanwhile, the position of the, Netherlands, of the Dutch government uh, is that if you're doing this for vulnerability disclosure, then this doesn't apply. But other governments are struggling with this and they don't really know what to do with it. Um, and what we need your help with also is that the EU is uh, doing a review of their implementation of the, the Wassenaar arrangement stuff and the other dual use uh, items. Um, <clears throat> so there's a regulation in the EU that describes how they look at this and this is where we can help, we can provide input and saying we don't really want that uh, vulnerability disclosure is impacted by export controls. So take this as a call to action, start talking to your government, start talking to export control people See if you can find someone who has an idea of what this might be, some, some member of parliament who has some ideas on this. Start asking questions and um, let's try to help make this uh, less of a burden for uh, vulnerability disclosure. So thanks.